Um, so yeah, so I'll be recording okay. and uploading it to YouTube, uh, if not tomorrow on Friday. So I'm going to put this out. Um, and yeah, w with all these Zoom events, I'm sure everyone's been doing a few during lockdown. Uh, any questions, please don't hesitate. Might be easier to stick them in the chat function just so people don't speak over each other. But I'll be keeping an eye on that. I'll also be keeping an eye on the waiting room because there will probably be a few people who are a little bit late. Um, but as I said, I'm recording it. So if anyone who comes in late, uh, please don't worry because I'll be sticking it on. But I'll hand over to Arta now, uh, Starter's Guide to Go Projects, which hopefully you can all see on the screen. Um, so yeah, over to you, mate. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so, hello everybody, I'm Artur. Um, you'll learn about me later on, because I don't want to bore you about myself now. Um, I think we'll wait like another two, three minutes before we start. Yeah. Um, just for the sake of all of us being here. Um, but yeah, so like as you uh, read on Meetup page, this will be an introduction to how to structure your gold code base. Um, we'll be talking about the big boys, the small boys. We'll be talking about pizza. We'll be talking about a lot of stuff, a lot of things that um, if you're on Reddit, for example, you can see a lot of questions about how to structure your go code base or how to do that or which uh, layout I should use. We also tackled that on our last event. So uh, the last event was about writing a small application to play music in your terminal. If you want to refresh on that, it's on Oliver Bernard's, uh, Bernard's uh, YouTube channel. So after that, please go and have a look. No pun intended here. Um, yeah. I think another minute. Um, if you have any questions, I think let's keep them for the end of the session. I'm more than happy to answer. Um, if you have your mic on, please turn it off for the sake of the quality time we'll have here together. Um, it's, it's always nice this way. <laughs> um, if you have any issues, just stuck them in the chat or um, post it on meetup page i will be checking the meetup page as we go um yeah cool two more minutes and then we run um if you can't see my screen please shout now or uh be quiet or not <laughs> i think i think it should be visible also the slides will be available after the um meetup i will do a post on my uh on my page, it's acondas.com. So if you want to have a refresher straight after we finish, or you want to read more about Go and programming in general, head to acondas.com. I should use Go there. I think they, they don't allow you to do the custom uh, domain names without paying uh, backloads of money. Seems like most people are in now, Arta. Um, I'll keep letting them in, uh, yep. but yeah, if, if you want to kick off and cool. then I'll, yeah, I'll let people in as and when they, they come on. Beautiful, beautiful. Then let's roll. Okay, so again, it's a starter's guide to go project. It treated like a hitchhiker guide without towels. Okay, what we will be talking about? We'll be talking about why should you even care about structuring your go code or code in general? Um, we'll be talking about how big players do it. You will learn about the big players in a second. We'll talk about how you can do it. And then by the end of it, we will go through a small, let's say, example of a small API you can build um, with the lessons we will we'll go over here. So why should you even care? Most of the time, if you start doing new language, you'll probably go over tons of pages, tons of tutorials, which will say, just code, J don't care about all that stuff. Just, just do the code or copy the code from here and it will magically work, which it's not that great because if you come from Java or C background, the project structure is inherently one of the things you have to know about. If you come from Python or JavaScript, 
you don't have to care about the project structure that much because most of the time it will be either in one file or spread out in the flat structure. You don't, you don't worry about stuff. In Go, given that Go has turned 10 last November, it's pretty young, we don't have you know, the rules set in stone, which gives us a lot of very fun possibilities. So let's roll with that. So when you start a project, the chances are that you've said some of those things before. I don't want to do anything specific with this package. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Well, I just want to test some things. Yeah, okay. I don't care about it because it's private repo. Okay, all valid, everything works. But then what if that code that you will write will turn your life around? What if um, this code, when it will go public on GitHub, it will go on Hacker News, it will go on Reddit, on all the message boards, and everybody will rave about your code. Then it's bad to have that one single comment which says, I've changed the structure because it was ugly. Yes, well, comments, you don't want to have ugly comments, do you? Yeah, but so. So it's good to think about those stuff from the very beginning. But before we'll start answering this question on how to do that, how to go with the structure, let's see how the big players, so to speak, do it. So let's have the situation. You started Go, wrote some single file programs, and then you want to be something bigger. You want to do something more. So you go to google.com, you type Google project structure. And then the first thing you will most probably see is the project layouts by going standards. Um, is it a valid started point? Yes, pretty much. Is it a thing done by Go guys? No, not really. Um, so this repo follows a historical structure of the projects as they went along. So you can see we have the most, the most, I forgot a word, sorry. Um, the thing you have to look here, the most important one will be package here, will be test, will be vendor, will be tools. Like that would be the first thing I would look for the code. But the very first thing when I started doing Go and I started reading that was, well, there's a lot of files. There's a lot of locations. Which thing goes where? Well, it's, it's not that tricky as it looks. So then when we take that, the next step would be, okay, I'm going to check how the biggest projects in Go do it. So you probably go over to Kubernetes, most probably because you've done something with Kubernetes um, or you know that Kubernetes is written in Go and this is like the most prime example on how things should work and look in Go. Okay, so as you remember from the last one, we have package, we have vendor, we have here, we have test, we have staging, we have command, we have docs, a lot of additional file structures that well, it, it, let's, let's put it this way. It's not making the thing visible and readable just like that. It's not um, Python-like where you have one file that rules them all and then you go over different directories. Okay, so we got Kubernetes. Who will be the big, big next one? Terraform. You can choose Docker here. I've chosen Terraform. Uh, because reasons and because one big reason, which is E2E here. So again, we have a bit different file structure, but nothing really changed. So the, the, the truth is that we, the, the Terraform and Kubernetes structure are basically the same, a bit convoluted, and they are, there's a lot of things going on here and there. Uh, I wanted to have this in my presentation, but we'll go into GitHub right now. Um, we'll see the Kubernetes tree. Um, the, the only reason why I couldn't do this in Kubernetes be because of the headers from the GitHub. 
So we have package, we have test, we have staging, we have vendor, API, a lot of things. So you can start being overwhelmed by this. And then to add to top of it, there's no entry file here. So we have no main.go, which we know and love and where we would start looking for things. So then the party starts. So we won't go into go mode because go mode won't tell us anything. Probably we won't go to the go some again, the same reason we sh we could look for the make file in the make file. But with that said, we're going to go back into Kubernetes in, uh, and Terraform a bit later. But with that said, all of those repositories I've shown you right now have very similar structure, but doesn't mean it's the only way. Um, so if you wrote some packages before this meetup, chances are you have something like package name and then the, fi then the file, which is the, the package name file, which has Go code and that's all. And you have single package or you wrote some application and you have a repository on GitHub with main.go, you just go to main.go or in the directory go run dot and everything's fine. So how we can think about our pro about the projects from ground up and not you know being overwhelmed by those those big things so the first thing you have to think about i'm not going to go there yet is that kubernetes terraform docker are enterprise grade structures so if you work in multinational multi-time zone company you have to have a good file structure you can't just do flat structure across the across the whole thing because well you will get lost well that's that's the truth so we have to scale it down to what we want to do what we want to build so the first thing i would look for is the flat structure so the flat structure is everything in one directory and then divide it into into some things so flat structure would be the best for small projects testing ideas and packages and by flat structure, I don't mean putting everything in main.go because, well, this is not, this is flat structure, but this is putting everything in main.go. It's not a, it's not a file structure by any means. So small projects and testing ideas should look like this. You can see that we have only one directory in the whole thing, which is assets. So the reason for assets is that if you have an image or if you have any binary you want to load into your program, you want to keep it in assets. So you don't want to have it laying around in the flat structure of your, of your files. You want to have it somewhere that you will be able to do yield the switcheroo rather fast. So then we have main.go and then we have functionalities. We'll, we'll talk about this in a second. We also have README and believe me, having proper documentation in whatever you do, if, even if you're doing it for your own good, even if you're doing it all alone, just, just have documentation. Even if that will be posted notes and then wrote down in README, it will save your life one day, trust me. So then the package difference between the small um the small project and the package is that we have no main.go main.go in go means that um the application is ready to be compiled so we will be running it locally or whatever else when it comes to package it's just the code bundled somewhere else which we will fetch into our software into into our application and then do something with it um, again, very important stuff, read me. Always, always. I would even, even if you go with GitHub or GitLab, it will allow you to do um, the repository with, with read me to be able to clone it, which is 
if you think about it, yeah, okay, it's easy to clone it then because you don't have to initialize it locally. But when you do that, just just do a small bit that this is the package which will do X, Y, Z, or this is a software, this is a, an application which will do X, Y, Z. Because then in two years, when you will recall the package, you don't have to go through the whole code base. You can just check readme and that's all. So, as you probably noticed, I don't have utils.go. Um, I don't believe in utils, and I guess a lot of people mar might argue with me that, but then where do I put the code for utility functions? Where do I put the code that is being shared across multiple files? This is why you have main.go, or this is why you have functionality. The problem with utils is that most of the time, it will end up being a garbage bin. It will end up being a place where you store all the functions, even the ones you don't really need, but you, keep, you kept them because, well, you forgot to delete them or you keep, you are keeping them for legacy reasons. So, not yet. Um, so, don't overthink, don't do the code dry from the ground up. Make it work. And then think about the functions that can go outside. If you're doing TDD, that will most probably be visible to you from the very, very start. TDD goes uh, for test-driven development, for those who don't know. Don't try to think about getting the functionalities dry and spread across the files. Just write how it, how it should work and then refactor, rework. If the files you are writing, if you have the aforementioned main.go and the functions that, and the functionality.go, and then your functionality.go grew to be, I don't know, 500, 600 lines, it started to be awfully big. Think about splitting them into small, um, small files, which will be grabbed by the functionality. So if you're doing an API and then you want to have your database actions somewhere, make them in postgres.go or database.go. So it's visible from the very start that this is where I keep my code. This is where I keep my code regarding the functionality X, Y, Z. The same goes for JSON, the same goes for any sort of functionality you will work with. And as I said, for readme. So, Probably most of you read books. I'm not judging anyone. If you don't read, that's fine. If you listen to audiobooks, that's fine. But the point I'm going uh, for is we are not um, poets. Well, chances are that if you had to ditch your code base for a week just to write documentation, it was the most dreaded week of work ever. Well, we don't like writing documentation. We want to have code which is nice and it's readable and doesn't have to have comments and you know all this magical stuff. But then life is not that gracious. Life is not that fun. You have to write documentation. So the best thing would be to have the minimum documentation you have to have for the application from the ground up. If you add a new functionality that will change how the, fun how the application starts up, Add it directly to README. Remember about those. Remember about those little things. Like code is fun, but knowing how the code runs, it's even more more fun. Okay, so we tackled flat structure, and then the another way would be to have the main.go again, and then packages within the file within within the the repo. So you could start thinking about mono repos here. Um, I would think here about a tad bigger application. So in this case, uh, where we group things by the functionality, we still assume that our application won't grow that big. It will be still rather small and it will be rather fun. It always be fun. But 
what if you had an idea for you know a bigger application i don't know you want to write a blog cms from ground up you want to do the things and you know that you will have to connect to some database you will have to do some validation etc 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 so then this file structure comes to to help so before going how it will look is that the, the question is will the package will be reused across all the apps so if yes if you know that you're working on the project that will reuse the functionalities here and there it's perfectly fine and it makes perfect sense to split them from the very start to have one repository for postgres one repository for json etc 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 and then import them into into the applications as you go if not then we can follow the big player setup i like to reference the big player setup because well there are big fish in the pond and there are small fishes in the pond and there are medium fishes in the pond and etc etc so this is historically if you go over smaller applications this is the file structure that you will see the most so it will have main.go somewhere to start the thing it will have readme again and then it will have three directories it will have the package which um, contains all the packages used in the application then you will have build so and the build scripts um, anything that allows the application to run and then you'll have examples examples will be mostly found in applications that um, requires the user to set to pre-set up something before we even start before we even run the thing so any package you can work on will probably have examples so going back to kubernetes here i will just do the small device here we don't have main.go here yeah so we would have to start thinking okay so my first guess would be to go into commands and then you start thinking okay kubectl maybe here and then you, you, you start to go with what i said before the big player structure requires you to do some digging from from ground up and right now ask yourself if you will be writing a tad bigger application you don't want to do that digging you don't want to if you, if your application becomes a startup and then you will hire somewhere else you don't want to you know run them through the whole thing to teach them this is how you start this is what you do etc 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 um i'll i will actually tell you the truth i knew that it will start here um because well i've used kubernetes but the more applications you write it's it's better to have them you know somewhere somehow nice it up so then let's go back again and then let's start reading the readme so this is the thing i've been telling from the very start they don't have to do that they could do you know basically this and this is what most of us would do like literally show this is my application if you want to reference it just reference it somewhere i don't care this is my application i know how it runs the thing is that if you will i don't know want to change job or show your code somewhere else to someone else you don't want to go again you know showing them step by step this is how i run my application this is what i do you know it, it doesn't make sense at least in my head so then they have the documentation interactive tutorial etc 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 i'm not saying do that much but even if you will have to run the application go to xyz and then do this or just type go run uh, dot that's fine that's fair enough so this is the point I'm, I'm jumping a bit but believe me it will make sense so 
Go was created as an alternative to those big C sharp, C++, Java applications. When um, the three musketeers of Go, Robert Griezmann, Rob Pike, and uh, I forgot again, um, when they created Go, they started writing Go in 2007 and in 2009 when it was released. They wanted to tackle all the problems we had with all those big enterprise applications. If you go with Java file structure, you will end up you know, digging through multitude of directories until you find the sweet spot which will run the application. And that's fine, it works in their case, it doesn't work that well in our. So if you can keep it simple, well, just do it. So this kicks back to the things I've said earlier. If you don't, if you're not building enterprise application or if you're not thinking about the enterprise application, don't use the big boys setup. Just do it plain and simple and then improve it as you go. So, well, I said that. so don't try to copy how, you know, those big fishes do that. Just do the baby, baby steps and build it as you go. So sort of think about TDD in creating your Go application. Okay, so with that said, I'm gonna do a small pause here. Does anybody has any questions? This is the time to ask them and I will wait like a second. Okay, that's that's good. The silence, silence is actually good. So, this is the requirements for our small API. So, this is this is actually taken from one of the production systems I am working on, which I can't disclose. But this is real life scenario. So. The requirement was for us to build a small API that will do something. So the, from then we got the requirements and then we started thinking, okay, so we will need logger and we will need database connector to be reusable across all the apps. So, okay, we have two packages and then there we have keys validator to be used only in the API. So, Okay, so let's start with the main app. So the main application was built in a way that will be readable for everyone from the ground up and well, it will allow for a fast iteration and you don't have to worry about where everything is. So when we go from the ground up, so we have the package directory because we know that this will be our packages. So in package we'll have application, so the app, and then we'll have the keys. So why do we have slash app and then all of those things? If that's a small API, um, I actually covered that on one of the other meetups you can find on my, on my page. If this is a small API, you will most probably have more than one functionality. You will probably have one more than one handler. So you'll have the handlers for the users, you will have handlers for, I don't know, anything else. So you want to keep them somewhere separate. You will have to kickstart the application. You will have to initialize the database, uh, initialize the logger, etc., etc., etc. And you want to have that entry point somewhere. So this is how I think about app.go. And then app, app underscore test.go contains all the functions to test functionality for the application startup. So in this case, app.go nine out of 10 will contain only three functions, which will be um, initialize, there are actually two, initialize, run, and then the file struct, and then the type struct, type abstract will have uh, the database connector and anything I need to reuse across the applications. And then the reason why I have handlers in the app and not handlers as the other package is because when you initialize the database, 
you can do a lot of very nice stuff like you know having the being able to reuse the connection and then you will have everything plugged into one structure and then you will share the variables across instead of using the global variables which you should never do you can share them using the structs in go which is a very a very good thing and we can talk about later if someone uh, wants to know more so okay we have this then we go to keys uh, we figured out that when we start up the the apis most of the time we will have to pre-set up them with some environmental keys we don't want to push them into the repos and then post them on uh, bitbucket github gitlab you don't ever want to put your keys somewhere uh, we don't want to hard code them and we want to be able to reuse the application in different environments so then we started writing keys.go which contains all the logic that will check the keys before the application starts and right now you might have the thing that will go okay okay but why won't you do, you know, os.getEnvironment and just check it in app.go or in main.go or where you, when you initialize the whole thing? Why won't you do it then? And let me answer you. So the first thing, you don't want to do, you don't want to use func init that much because it doesn't allow you to test the application properly afterwards. It's a bit wonky how it works because there's something that happens before main.go kicks in and you will want to grow it out and that's never a good thing and then linking to that when the application grows you can add the checks for the keys in one specific place and if there's any more logic like i don't know you want to pre-pass the boolean to be to be sure that this is a boolean or pre parse the integers to know that they are the integers well you can do it in keys.go any other interface doesn't any other thing doesn't have to know how keys are being validated because you will just call keys.validate and that's the the whole thing okay so we have those two packages then in build we have docker file and docker compose uh, in the case of this application we didn't want to do any external database um, that was a POC so you know setting up RDS on Amazon wasn't actually a good idea and we wanted to be able to share that application across as many people as we can so we set up a docker compose with pre-baked in Postgres image so the application was plugging directly into it and then you have main.go which in our case would contain only few things. So our main.go, as I mentioned before, will have the keys check. So you can see that I'm passing a struct into the check function. So then if I will start writing more applications and actually will come to the conclusion that, okay, I want to validate more than this application. I want to validate more, more than this. Then I can take the keys package out of, the, out of our application and use it as a standalone package. You can also fetch it from here, but I wouldn't recommend that because then you end up with a mess of dependencies across the stack. So this is the first thing. And then, as I said, in the app.go, I don't know if I've shown it here. Um, in the app.go, I have two functions and then the one struct. So I create the struct and then on the struct, I call the functions. Um, I, when, when it comes to initializing APIs, I believe that if there's any error at the very beginning, you should check it, you know, right at the start of the runtime. You don't have to wait until the, I don't know, the database is initialized, et cetera, et cetera. You can check it at the very beginning. So my func, the func main will always be as simple as possible. So then 
I do the error from initialize. And if the error is not nil, I call log.fatal. I tend not to use panic um, out of many reasons. Um, I just do log fatal, which is basically log dot print and then OS dot exit one. So then it depicts that there's some error with, with the uh, with the application. And probably if you can see, I have a compilation error here, but I was writing that uh, in the in the slide. So then I start running the application, the application kickstarts the whole server. And then if the server fails, I just bubble up the error here. Okay, I actually have. So in app.go, I have two very important things. So we have the abstract, which contains the router and then contains the database, which is an interface. So whenever I will be building an, an API, I don't want to bake the database into the API. Even if you're building the smaller, the smallest thing and you want to have a, a, I don't know, Postgres database, in my head, it's very good thing to actually do it as an interface rather than baked in, baked in database. And here's why. Requirements change. Even if you're not in a big company and you're doing it for yourself, while you go over the iterations of the application, the new version, sometimes you will end up with finding out that the stack that you set up for yourself, that you started with, is not exactly what you wanted. It's not exactly what the application needs and the requirements has changed as we go. And if you baked the database in at this point, then you end up with a monstrosity to change because you have to find each subsequent call to the database and check how can I remove it? And then you have to remove, then you have to reroute, rewrite it to the new database engine, which is always a pain. In this way, we do a bit more, a bit more at the very beginning, but then we end up as we go. If I want to change the database from Postgres to Mongo or to Couchbase or to, well, literally anything else, I just have to write a package that will satisfy this interface and that's all. So speaking about that, this is how rewriting the handlers will look. I won't have to do anything because my handler will call the database function with the parameter it, it requires, but the handler is completely oblivious from which database is being used, how it's being used, you know, what is the actual call to the database? You don't have to worry about that in the handler. Handler has to get something from the user and then returning some, return something to the user. So it doesn't have to know about database. It doesn't have to know about any of those, any of those things. So that's why I just call one simple function and then I return it as payload. Um, if you're wondering here what the payload is, I've trimmed the code a bit uh, from what I had before because then we will end up with 40 something lines. So the payload would be something you will set up to return to the user. The JSON response is a wrapper around uh, wwrite. So I write on the, I write all the headers. Um, I do, I marshal the JSON response into that and then I return it. Um, I've tackled that on the blog. So if you want to see how actually JSON response works, head over to the blog, acondes.com and read about it. Okay, so we have that. Then we need the logger. So in, in the requirements was that for now, the logger will be used only to log into the console, but in the future, we want to use Prometheus to be able to fetch the logs into Prometheus. So you might think, okay, I can, all, I can use the built-in logger and then do some magic on it, which it actually allows you to. And 
then I will do something as I go. Okay, makes sense. Um, but I wanted to have something, oh, sorry, more robust. I wanted to have something which will allow me to do some more things. So in this case, um, I'm using a small package from Uber, which is a very nice login package. And if you want to find something that will allow you to do the logs in JSON and in the console, this is your way to go. And I really recommend that. So my package will be super basic. It will have the, the package file. It will have readme again to understand how it works and then go mod go some because I use modules across the stack. And then the database. So we, if you remember how we talked about the flat structure, we want to the we want to split the functionalities across another files. So in this case, we'll we'll have actually two files because we are hand, we are tackling the users. So we have to log in user, get user, create the user, modify user, delete user. So we will tackle all those three, all of those four. So our database will have in the database.go, it will have all the functions that will be split across, that will be used across all the files. And it will have all the things to allow us to initialize the database and also the struct for the database. And then user.go will have all the functionalities to actually fetch the user from the database. And this is where the um, interface satisfaction kicks in. Kicks in. So, the reason why it's, it's split into files and it still works is because it follows the same logic as it goes in the app. So actually in the database, I have type database struct, which is most probably empty. And then each function that fetches something from the database is referencing this struct. So then the, actually the struct is, um, satisfying the interface. I know it's, it's a bit wonky, but once you will start thinking about the responsibilities rather than the functions, it allows you to do way more, way simpler. So I can see that we have some comments in the chat. Would database.go also contain a code to create tables? Um, so it depends on the requirements. So how I think about the database is that this is only a way to connect to the database. I don't want to do anything with the database whatsoever here. So it depends actually on the requirements because if you have pre-set up database, then you don't have to worry about that. If you um, have, if you, if you, okay. So if I'm using Postgres and then you're writing the database connector, you can use, for example, something like uh, GORM, which will allow you to do the migrations here. So then, Actually, this is a very good question because then we start to think about who should be responsible for spinning up the database. And I would argue if that's the database package, because the database package only provides you the way to connect to the database and nothing else. It just has to be able to connect to the database and that's all. So I would I would more pro most probably I would keep it in the main application that has to has to do something in the build process. So if you remember this one here, um, I would probably add some script here which will build the database from the ground up for me. That's that that would be how how I would handle it. Again it pretty much depends on the requirements that you have in the application. Okay, so in conclusion, expand as you go. I'm gonna go to the questions in a second. Expand as you go, 
and don't overthink it from the start. Don't get um, overwhelmed by the structure from the very beginning. Just, just go and do it. Use the structure that makes sense to your application. If you know that your application is going to grow to the enterprise size, okay, that's fine. Start small, grow big. Think about the overall architecture. I'm, feel like, I'm feeling like I'm repeating myself, but this is very important. Think about the bigger picture, but then still be here and now and build it up. And also have fun because this is the most important stuff. So if you want to keep everything in main.go, okay, go do it. But then think about how you will be able to refactor that and expand that. Because if you have an application which will hold 40 lines from the ground up, it doesn't make sense to build, you know, the very big structure. You just have 40 lines in main.go. And as the, as the last slide, and then we'll go into questions. I'm a Go engineer at ECS Digital. Um, if you want to ask me any questions afterwards, find me on Twitter, find me on LinkedIn, uh, go onto my blog and read stuff. Uh, I, wrote, I write mostly, mostly about Go and programming. Actually, Go. And then I uh, promised to those who read the blog, um, I will. I promised why. I promised an answer to the question: uh, Is pizza with pineapple and olives edible? Yes, it is. It got that you know the sour thing. It's not Hawaiian, but you know this is pizza. It loves it. So okay, let's go. <laughs> I wouldn't go with half fun now, suffer, suffer later. You can have, you know, the very nice in between. Do you have any preference for IDEs? So um, I use Vim, period. I've uh, transitioned from multitude of different IDEs and I use Vim with uh faith then go and this is all i need that said um i've i've played around with goland for a, for a while and this is really good and goland is is a really good ide um but again if you use vim uh, you can use nerd tree or you don't even have to, I don't use Net3 because then it affects the performance of Vim. So I just navigate throughout the application as I go. Um, I'm not a very big fan of VS Code um, because of many reasons. The biggest one would be that the startup times in VS Code are not great. No, it's after all, an electron based app with JavaScript core inside. If you have any questions, you can write them in the in the chat or you can speak up. Um, I think we, we can spend some time on that. If not, uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, yeah, okay. To handle more complex database queries, would we should add it to the database interface or create interface for the models? Um, so that's a very nice question. So if you go, well, let's go into the interface we've set up for the application. So this interface will get all the functionalities required from the database struct. So I would put everything here because then you know the application doesn't care about how complex the query would be the application just cares about i'm giving you this and i want to have that end of story it doesn't matter how complex the query would be um i know where you're coming from but if you would have you know, the query that has to join across different tables, I would just do here, um, 
let's say we have to, it's a blog post, so we have to fetch the blog post written by the user. I would just do um, a function which will be called, I don't know, um, fetch blog posts by user with a parameter um, of user ID, and then it returns the array of the posts. And that's the only thing that your application has to know about it. And then you call it again the same way as you, as you would call it here. And then in your database um, package, you worry about the query there. So to answer your question a bit around, you just add the function here, and then you have to make sure that it will be satisfied by the interface provided by the package. Seems like that might be all the questions. Uh, yeah, looks like it. Um, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks again, Arta. Uh, another great talk and useful for, as I mentioned at the start, anyone uh, sort of building blocks, the language and stuff. Um, apart from the pineapple on the pizza, I thought was brilliant today. Um, <laughs> can't agree with that, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, thanks very much. Uh, anyone who was late, apologies. That's most likely because of my fault with the Zoom link. Uh, this whole thing has been recorded though, and will be going online, if not tomorrow, definitely Friday. Uh, so I'll send out the link via the meetup group, uh, the link to the YouTube video. Um, as Arthur said, you can see his details on screen here. Please feel free to reach out with him, uh, to him, sorry, for anything to do with the technology. Uh, Anything to do with the Go Market or, or jobs, please reach out to me on, on my LinkedIn uh, and take a look at the Meetup page for future events, uh, the Golang in London LinkedIn page for, um, for the previous videos or the Oliver Bernard website or YouTube account for, uh, for everything else that my colleague's been doing in, in different areas as well. So plenty there for you guys. As I said, the video will be coming on soon. And yeah, thanks everyone very much. Thank you guys. Cheers, Arthur. Thank you.